email to be able to send out hundreds of messages to publishers easily and cheaply. So I wondered how long he'd been doing that to be rejected 800 times. Now, Lewis might be a doubtful case, but there are many famous authors who have the rejection slips to actually prove it. Jack London, for instance, the author of Call of the Wild, had over 600 rejections before making a sale. In the museum that's dedicated to him, a lot of those rejection slips are actually pasted on the walls. Louis L'Amour received over 200 rejections for his westerns before he went on to sell 330 million copies. Chicken Soup for the Soul by Jack Canfield was rejected 144 times. Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind was rejected 38 times. James Patterson's first book was rejected 31 times. John Grisham's first book was rejected 28 times. Dr. Seuss was rejected 27 times. A Wrinkle in Time was rejected 26 times. And all of these stories tell us, tell, told me in particular as an aspiring author, be persistent, stick with it, believe in yourself even if others don't. Publishers make, mistake about, make mistakes about what readers want. Stay the course, keep on keeping on, be resolved, be determined, persevere and don't take rejection personally. Take as your model instead the examples of people who were resilient. Consider, for example, Abraham Lincoln. He was defeated when he ran for the Illinois House of Representatives in 1832. He was defeated when he ran for the US House of Representatives in 1843. He was defeated for the Senate in 1855. He was defeated for Vice President in 1856 and he was defeated for the Senate again in 1858. Did he let defeat define him? Of course not. Lincoln had a few successes in between these defeats and he went on to become one of America's most famous presidents. He was elected in 1860, just two years after that last defeat for the Senate. Or consider the inspiration of country and western singer Dolly Parton. She revealed this in her autobiography. She said, my high school was small. So during graduation, each of us got a chance to stand up and announce our plans for the future. I'm going to junior college, one boy would say. I'm getting married and moving to Maryville, a girl would follow. And when my turn came, I said, I'm going to Nashville to become a star. The entire place erupted in laughter. I was stunned. Somehow, though, that laughter instilled in me an even greater determination to realise my dream. I might have crumbled under the weight of the hardships that were to come had it not been for the response of the crowd that day. Sometimes it's funny the way we find inspiration. It was the mocking laughter and rejection of her dream that made Dolly more determined than ever. Or, Consider the prolific inventor Thomas Edison, who is said to have tried and failed a thousand times to invent the light bulb. Some stories vary the attempts to 3,000 or 6,000 or even 10,000. In fact, Edison was not the lone inventor that many stories proclaim him to be. He had a backup team, they were called the Muckers. And they were part of all these attempts, however many there were. And what they discovered as they tried to get the inventions out there was that the myth of the lone inventor was so pervasive and such a good marketing tool that Edison invented everything that came out of the team. So what you can find by those numbers, 3,000, 6,000, 10,000, is that they're all exaggerated. They're exaggerated as the stories about C.S. Lewis and the number of rejections that he received are. And all these kinds of stories 
can assume a kind of legendary status over time. It's not a modern phenomenon either. Maybe you've heard the story of Robert the Bruce and the Spider. Soon after Robert became King of Scotland in the early 14th century, he was defeated in battle by the English. He was driven into exile and he was hiding out in a remote cave off the coast of Ireland and he saw a spider trying to build a web. It would start and then fall and then laboriously climb up the thread to continue on making the web. The spider's philosophy of try, try again inspired Robert the Bruce to stop running and to return to fight again. Now the 14th century must have been a great time for breeding such legends because a very similar one comes out of Central Asia. The Emperor Tamerlan, who was a descendant of the Mongol warlord Genghis Khan, was badly defeated in battle. He lay hidden in a barn and enemy troops were scouring the countryside looking for him. Suddenly he noticed an ant trying to push a kernel of corn that was many times bigger than itself over a wall. 69 times the ant tried and failed, but on the 70th attempt, the 70th attempt, the ant succeeded. And leaping to his feet, Tamerlane said, Little ant, if you can do it, I can too. That day he changed his outlook, he reorganised his forces, and he went back and he sadly defeated his enemy. Now the point I want to make about all these stories across the internet is they're not trying to be accurate. They're trying to be encouraging. And it's not just messages on the internet that push you to believe in yourself. In bookstores, gift shops, cafes and kitchen walls, you find wonderful motivational memes, quotes and posters. Seminars, sermons and speeches all disseminate this kind of information to encourage you to never, ever, 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 ever give up. <laughs> You might even think that that's what I'm trying to do now. Some of this is accurate, but most is not. But that's not the point, none of that matters. Because whether it's about a book, a relationship, or a life calling, all of this is about soothing our wounded hearts when we're rejected and reinforcing our determination to make a comeback. As I testified last night, it took me 27 years of hard work, perseverance, grit and determination for my first book to be traditionally published. I'm not going to detail all those setbacks and heartbreaks again because you can read them in the book that I'm about to give you at the end of this session called Hidden in the Cleft. One thing I want to say that I learned along the way and no one ever told me was this. In fact, encouragement can be immensely dangerous. Spiritually, very few things have the potential to be more damaging. I never, ever suspected this until last year. You see, the lesson I took out of all these very heartening stories was this. Rejection is a fact of life. Just pick yourself up, get over it, handle it, hang in there and shout as Jack Canfield said when he, that he did after each one of those 144 rejections of chicken soup for the soul, next. <laughs> now let me be quite clear, rejection is a fact of life. And it's also correct that we are called to overcome it. Until the end of last year, that's all I really knew about it. We're called to overcome it. As I looked at scripture and I saw Cain you know he may not be the first person to be rejected but he's the first person who got God's advice on it and what God said to him was sin is crouching at your door and you must overcome it and what he was experiencing was feelings of rejection at that time so the issue is this we are actually taught to think that overcoming is kind of thrusting the rejection to one side and then persisting until we reach the goal. And like I said, I never suspected anything was wrong with this until late last year. And then a couple of my friends asked me for help concerning their issues of rejection. 
Now over the years I've talked a lot about thresholds and when I talk about thresholds and the spirits that govern thresholds, I've generally referred to rejection for about two minutes in all of those seminars because that's how long it actually takes me to tell you what to do about it. You simply overcome it. There's not just rejection but there's a spirit of rejection and whenever you attempt to come into your calling or even to something that might conceivably have a remote connection to your calling, this particular spirit comes out swinging. And the reason why it comes out swinging when <coughs> not actually into your calling, but something that might have a remote connection to it is that only God knows what your calling is. Spirits of the threshold don't know what they are, so they have to look for things that might be it. So this spirit, when, you, when it comes out swinging, people try to bind it, but that's not going to work permanently. In fact, I am starting, as I research more and more about this, to have really horrible suspicions that binding it might actually be playing into its hands. And I noticed that when Jesus encountered it, as I'll talk about a bit later, he rebuked it and he mentioned prayer and fasting but he didn't have a word about binding. Now the other thing that people try to do when this spirit of rejection is casted out, but that's not going to work permanently either. Some spirits you can remove from your life, but this one and some of the other threshold spirits, for very good legal reasons that I'll mention later in the talk, you're stuck with these guys. They will come back and they will come back and they will come back. Now, as I said before, arguably the first person to experience rejection in the, in the Bible is Cain. Maybe, okay, it was his parents as they were expelled from Eden. But regardless of that, he's the one that actually receives God's advice when it comes to rejection. This is what Genesis chapter 3 verses 4 to 7 says. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry? the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. Now we can see by the mention of a door, God mentions a door, that this is a threshold issue. This is about Cain coming into his calling. The sin that God mentions is attached to the feelings of dejection and rejection that Cain is experiencing. And God simply tells him that he has to master it. So here we have the word of the Lord on the matter of rejection and the spirit that wants to control us through it. Master it. Subdue it. Just do it. Now this is easier said than done. I know this because my dad struggled his entire life with feelings of rejection. And how did he master the spirit of rejection? He simply rejected others before they rejected him. The spirit of rejection has this seductive way of saying, I am your only friend. And my dad fell for it time and time again. And he would admit that. He would get prayer and it would go away and six months later it would come back worse than ever. Now my mum has also struggled all her life with rejection. She's very, very different to my dad. How did she master rejection? Well, sometimes she did the freeze in fright thing and was completely and totally silent, couldn't say anything. And sometimes she did the flee into the night thing. She could run from it. She would be totally stunned into silence by it. 
even when she was completely innocent of the things that she was accused of. Either way, whether she froze or whether she fled from it, she somehow always managed to wind up accepting it. She too fell for that call of the spirit of rejection. I am your only friend. And I watched both my parents and something deep inside me said, yep, there's got to be a better way. So with God's help, I have to learn to overcome rejection because I want to be an author and look, C.S. Lewis was rejected 800 times. That's what I thought back then. And I look at all these other people. And I watched so many of my friends in different writing groups go, I've had one rejection and that's it. I'm going to go off and do it myself. They couldn't handle it. I said, I have to learn to handle it. I can't afford to have a thin skin. I've just got to be able to deal with it. And as I said, until late last year, I thought I had it all sussed. But then a couple of my friends who had terrible problems with rejection asked me to help them to learn to subdue and master it. And that raised some really difficult questions for me because although I knew how to handle rejection somehow, I wasn't exactly sure of the mechanism that I used to do it. I knew that the breakthrough that I'd experienced that I told you about last night was a result of dealing with my false refuge. But was that all that was needed? Both my friends had worked through their false refuges but still had rejection issues. So why didn't I have the same? I was at a loss to know how to help these friends. When it came right down to it, I realised that I had distilled the essence of C.S. Lewis's 800 rejections and Thomas Edison's 1,000 failures, never mind the accuracy of those numbers, and condensed the lesson down to do not take rejection personally. Just shut it aside and try again. And somehow, over time, that had become a life statement, a kind of vow that enabled me to handle rejection. Truth is, I just simply ignored it. I felt the steam and I let it go. But I didn't know how I'd learned to do that. The only thing I could think of when it came down to it was a couple of times early when I had been starting out in my writing and I'd been babysitting as a way of getting money. And the children I was minding had been put to bed and one of them cried out and I went to see what was wrong. One of the boys opened one eye and said, I hate you. <coughs> and I said, no worries, little buddy. It's okay, I can handle rejection, go back to sleep. And he did. And that was an important experience because being able to state, I can handle rejection, seemed integral to what I did. However, I felt that if I said to the friends who put me on the spot and asked for my help, just declare you can handle it, then I would be telling them to paper over a core wounding. Mm -hmm. My dad had a core wounding. He was rejected from the womb, and that was his issue. That was why he couldn't get rid of it. He would achieve nothing, in fact, except deeper rejection. So I went to God and I said to him, I need your help. I don't have a clue how I handle rejection so successfully. So I can't possibly help anyone else do it if I don't know how I manage to handle it myself. And there was silence for a couple of seconds. And then God said to me, and just why would you want to teach anyone to handle rejection? And you know those moments when you suddenly find you're holding your breath and your heart has stopped and a whirlwind has suddenly swept every single last thought out of your brain. It was one of those moments. Actually, my brain wasn't completely devoid of all thought. It had this sneaking suspicion that just tiptoed in and the sneaking suspicion was, I don't think God thinks terribly much of handling rejection. In fact, 
I don't think he thinks it's any better than my dad's way of dealing with it. Or my mum's way. In fact, I have a sense from his tone that he thinks it's worse than either of them. So I talked to God, and I talked some more, and I talked some more, and I asked my friends if they had got anything from the Lord. And one had a strange image of red hair, and the other spoke about atonement, and I got a verse from Malachi, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And it took me nearly two weeks of talking to God to realise that all these three things were interconnected. It was as if he'd handled, handed us three different pieces of a jigsaw and asked us to put them together. Red hair, atonement, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Once you realise that these are interconnected, it all depends upon realising that Esau has two other names. Edom is one of his names, and it means red. Seir is the other name, and it means hairy. But it also means goat. And the connection here was that there's a goat that has to do with the Day of Atonement. Specifically the scapegoat. In fact, once you start to think about it, the ultimate rejection symbol is probably the scapegoat. Mm. Scripture doesn't give us terribly much detail on the scapegoat. So I'm going to give you half of all that it gives us in one go. This is from Leviticus 16, from verses 8 to 10. On the Day of Atonement, Aaron must take two male goats and present them to the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle. He is to cast sacred lots to determine which goat will be reserved as an offering to the Lord and which will carry the sins of the people to the wilderness of Azazel. Aaron will then present as a sin offering the goat chosen by Lot for the Lord. The other goat, the scapegoat, chosen by Lot to be sent away, will be kept alive, standing before the Lord. When it is sent away to Azazel in the wilderness, the people will be purified and made right with the Lord. So the important details in this little section are, it's the Day of Atonement, number one, an escape goat is sent into the wilderness. There's a great deal of ambiguity in the text. However, it would appear that Azazel is the name of a goat demon. Now that might sound strange, but bear with me. A lot of scholars refuse to believe that God would give an ordinance to send something away to any demonic entity but I actually believe that that is quite correct. And the reason I believe that it's quite correct is because of what happens on the Day of Atonement in the last year of Jesus' life on earth. On that day, he was out in the wilderness, just like the scapegoat, and he was with his disciples right in front of a shrine to a goat demon. Hard to believe, but perfectly true. And this is what he says to his disciples at that moment. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, 
Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. That's from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. And this is the very famous exchange where Simon and Jesus, um, Simon gets a new name after admitting Jesus as the Messiah, and Jesus sets up his church. All this happened at Caesarea Philippi, in front of a place called the Gates of Hell. Now the Gospel writer, Matthew, didn't mention this, but the Gates of Hell at Caesarea Philippi was part of a shrine to a goat demon. He didn't need to mention it, because everyone knew. This particular demon was half goat and half man, and was the Greek godling of flocks and herds. Its name was Pan. We have a word in English derived from the name of Pan. It's panic. That is how Pan allegedly won wars for the Greeks, through causing panic in opposing armies. So here's a major connection that we can find. Panic and rejection are spiritually linked. And let's go back to the words of Jesus at this incredibly seminal moment in the history of the church. It's not the birth of the church. In fact, that's about eight and a half months away, nearly nine months away at Pentecost. It's the moment of conception. And it's on a rock. And it's not just any rock. We know from the Hebrew name that Jesus gave Simon, which is Kephas, that it's not just any rock. Kephas can be translated in several ways, but it's derived from the name of the Day of Atonement, which happens to be the day that this happened, this very event happened. Kephas means stone of atonement or covering for sin, but basically the word that encapsulates all that it is, is cornerstone. And as we know, Jesus is the stone that was rejected by the builders but became the head of the corner. There are many um, verses that refer to this. Psalm 118, 22, 1 Peter 2, 7, Mark 12, 10, Acts 4, 11, Matthew 21, 42, and Luke 20, 17. What Jesus was doing at that moment was building his church on a cornerstone, but because he was actually symbolizing the scapegoat at the time, it's the rejected cornerstone. He symbolized himself as that scapegoat by going to a goat demon shrine and standing in front of the gates of hell. Now, at first sight, this is pretty much terrible news for those of us wanting to be rid of the spirit of rejection. The legal right of the spirit of rejection is here. To be right there on the doorstep as we move into our calling. However, there's some really good news too. Because the Gospels tell us that six days after this event, Jesus went up a high mountain. And there he was transfigured in glory, and he heard the approving words of the Father, This is my beloved Son, my chosen one. And what more acceptance could you want in life than to hear that direct from God? And as I read this and put it all together, I said to my friends who were asking for help, I have it sussed. <laughs> At least I think I have. He 
You sit with Jesus as the rejected cornerstone for six days and then you get to the place of being the beloved. So I said to him, I'll test it. I'll do it first. Never let somebody else do it first. So to test out my theory, the next time I felt rejected, I sat with Jesus in the rejection for six days. And six days more. And six days more. And just as I was beginning to have doubts about my theory and that I'd understood the scriptures correctly, I said to God, mm, this, this is taking much, much longer than I expected. And he said, well, it wouldn't be taking so long, but you keep dropping out of the place of rejection with Jesus and going to handling it. And I went, hmm. I didn't notice that I was going to handling mode. And God said to me, you know, you've mastered the art of ignoring rejection. So much so, let me ask you a few questions. How many times have you been rejected in life? I said to God, well, uh, not very often. I'm very lucky in that respect. I'm nothing like other people. You know, they've experienced serious rejection. My dad experienced serious rejection. My mum experienced serious rejection. But me... No. And there was a short pause. And then God said to me, <clears throat> what about the time you were expecting to announce your engagement and your fiancé got up and announced it to someone else? Wasn't that rejection? And I felt this kind of quick step to the heart, but I rushed to the side and I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I've forgotten about that. <laughs> <laughs> and then God said to me, <clears throat> And what about the time your best and only friend at high school simply stopped talking to you and never ever came near you again and never explained what it was about? Wasn't that rejection? And I went, hmm, yeah, I'll never find out why she did that. We lived in each other's pockets for nearly five years until one day, without a word of explanation, she took up with some other girls and ignored me entirely. And I said to God, hmm, yeah, I've forgotten about that too. He wasn't finished. He said, what about the time all your friends in that social club treated you like slime because of something somebody said about you? Something that no one was ever willing to reveal or ask you whether it was true or not. Wasn't that rejection? And I took that kind of deep breath and I recalled the time that more than 20 people turned their backs on me and just walked away as if I forgot the plague. And I never ever have found out about what was said. For years I was actually desperate to learn what it was until one day I realised God was asking me to surrender my need to know. And even as I realised this, I also recognised that I did the same thing as one of my brothers when it came to rejection. One of my brothers always said, just build a bridge and get over it. And I've never ever thought terribly much of his way of dealing with things because building a bridge wasn't forgiving. It was ignoring. And I realised how much I ignored rejection. God kept dredging up the past and he went on and on, reminding me of the times I've been sidelined for standing up for others or standing up for myself. He reminded me of incidents that were so painful that it had taken years to properly forgive the people involved. I think, I think I had forgiven them, but then some trigger would come up and I'd have to forgive them all over again. How on earth had I forgotten all this stuff? It was raw and the rejection hurt in a way that it shouldn't. And I went to God and I said to him, haven't I actually forgiven these people? Because I thought I had. And God said to me, you know, there's many things that you've forgiven them for, but not for their cooperation with the spirit of rejection. When he said that, I had a really bad feeling, you know, the sort of bad feeling that they had in Star Wars. You know, there's the just, you know, that bad feeling. I said to God, this is going to be like staying in Gethsemane with Jesus, isn't it? It's going to really, really hurt. It's going to be seriously unpleasant. I don't think I can do it. I just don't think I can. I need help. 
And even knowing it was only for six days, I just simply didn't believe I could make it through. If the disciples couldn't watch for just one hour, how was I going to make it through a whole week? And God is faithful. He helped me sit in the rejection with Jesus, the rejected cornerstone. He helped me to endure the sadness. There was a lot of sadness and a lot of panic. And the sense of being hunted. And worst of all, the knowledge that if all of the people who'd rejected me had their time over, they would probably reject me in the same way once again. And they wouldn't explain their actions this time either. Everything would be just as baffling and inexplicable as it has always been. So I sat with Jesus, the rejected cornerstone. And one day passed, and two, day, two days passed, and three days passed, and four days passed. And on the fourth day, I noticed that the spirit of rejection had done a bunk. Yes! Things were so much clearer. Why, oh, look at that, I said to Jesus. Now that the spirit of rejection is gone, I can see that there was something behind it. There's something hiding there. And I looked closely, and suddenly I recognized what I was seeing and feeling in my own spirit. And I said, multitudes of four-letter swear words at that moment. Because what I had seen, what I had discerned, was a spirit of wishing. And I went back to my friends who'd asked me to help them with overcoming this spirit of rejection. And I told them what I discovered. Because I wasn't sure whether wishing was a problem unique to me or whether it was more widespread. But they immediately connected with it. What's wishing? Sounds like harmless kid stuff, you know, blow out the candles and make a wish. Wish upon a shooting star, throw a coin in the fountain and make a wish. Wish me luck, don't you just wish? And wishes can indeed be harmless, but they can also be very dangerous. Because when we make a wish at a moment of rejection, we can be stepping across a dark frontier. At the moment of rejection, we should reach for a prayer, not a wish. We should put our prayer to Jesus and hold on to him, hold on to his prayer shawl as he stands before the Father not fling out a wish that may well bring us into agreement with the powers of darkness. Who is it that we want to empower our words? Jesus through prayer or an ungodly spirit through a wish? I said this last night and I'll say it again. It's no coincidence that basic level witchcraft is called wishcraft. I personally realised that I had made such a snarled and twisted mess of it all. Handling rejection, wishing, panicking, and irrational decisions that I didn't have a clue where to start to fix it. I've done a lot of prayer ministry. I have a lot of clues. I know that the first step is recognizing. I know that you then confess, repent, Give. I knew everything and I took one look at it and went, this is such an enormously tangled mess, I can't identify anything in it to even begin to know where to start. It was an impossible, chaotic disaster. So I said to Jesus, I just surrender it to you. I have no idea what to do about it. <coughs> about a month after that, I felt that Jesus had handled it enough that I could actually start to repent and renounce. 
that there was a kind of way in. And I wasn't repenting and renouncing because Jesus needed my help. He certainly did. But I wanted to say to the spirit world, I am in agreement with what Jesus is doing. I want to declare that that's my position. That I am committed to Jesus and I am committed to what he is accomplishing for me. So I started to pray and I said, I wish to declare before the spirit world that I am in complete agreement with what Jesus is doing. I wish to declare. And for five minutes I went on like this before I suddenly realized what was coming out of my mouth and I went, everything's starting with wish. I never pray like this, never ever. I have never prayed like this in my life. And I suddenly realized how deep the problem was. And that all that had happened was that Jesus had brought it to the surface sufficiently for me to recognize that it was so incredibly messy still that he was still needing to work on it. I believe he is still working on it for me today. Nonetheless, I also believe that he is allowing me to move beyond it at the same time. One of the reasons why I believe that this is the case is because when you get to my point in life, there's not much you wish for anymore. A wish is something that you regard as, well, you know, if I were to wish for anything, it has to be something that I cannot accomplish by myself. It's got to be in the miraculous sphere. It's got to be something that just wouldn't come to pass with anything that I might do in and of myself. It's got to be way out there. And so sometime after this, not very long after this, suddenly a temptation appeared. And it was so targeted at what I had always wanted that I just thought to myself, that is so specific, that is so much a temptation to wish rather than to pray about it that I don't even know where to start. Because I said to God, you know, I think that what you're putting before me is a desire of my heart. And you've promised to give me that. But how do I untangle that from a wish? I've no idea. So again, I just put it before Jesus. And I asked him to sort it out. And I believe that he is doing that. So what can you take away from my story today? First, rejection is a fact of life. Second, there is a spirit of rejection which can latch on to your fleshly feelings and cause you to choose any number of options which don't involve sitting with Jesus as the rejected cornerstone. Third, this spirit whispers kindly to you that it is your only friend. In fact, the friends that I had that I talked about, I said, does this spirit say to you it's your only friend? And both of them said, you know, yes. I said, can you actually give up its friendship? And they said, until you ask that question, intellectually, yeah, but my heart, my heart is in a space that says, no, you can't do that, it's my only friend. It actually functions, this spirit, it's not your only friend, it actually functions by hunting you and it wants the hunt to cause you to panic and make an irrational decision. This is the spirit of pain. This spirit is a spirit of panic and of hunting. And that irrational decision 
that you make may put you in a space where you are in agreement with something like the spirit of Python and then you suddenly become constricted. What it's trying to do is to actually cause you to come into agreement with one of its friends, one of its allies. Now for me, this happened to be the spirit of wishing. But for you it might be one of the other spirits who can buy your way into your calling. And although I haven't mentioned this particular part of its agenda up to this point, it follows after you to undo the good that you do. As I look back, during my childhood, I would have so many dreams about this particular spirit. And it would always be following after me in my dreams, but never actually ever catching up with me. And remember I was talking at the beginning about C.S. Lewis and his very first book. Well, it was a book of poems. And I came across this book of poems several years back. And as I read this, I recognised in this book of poems all of the spirits that he was writing about. This was before he became a Christian. And he even had the same names for these spirits that I did. And one of the things that he had in his book that I hadn't recognised about this spirit that was always following after me was it was there to undo the good that you do. So it's not just there to follow after you, hunt you, cause you to panic. It's also there to undo what you do as a Christian. <coughs> now, maybe all of this is way too hard. For some people it is. So if that's the case, then your takeaway from today's talk is that persistence is what you need. Be like Jack Canfield every time chicken soup for the soul was rejected, turn right around and shout next. But God will eventually bring you to a place where you have to deal with this. And if you already know what I'm talking about and have encountered such a spirit, I'm going to simply advise you to do this. Yeah, you know the answer. The answer is Jesus. He's very simply always Jesus. Talk to him about it. Just simply open your heart and say, this is how I feel rejected. This is what's happened. Can we talk about what went on? What it was actually going on there? Sometimes, as he said to me, in some particular instances, I will tell you exactly what was going on, but in others, you need to surrender your need to know. So if you've encountered the Spirit, you talk to Jesus, you do what he tells you. Obedience is just such an important part of this. Because at the end of the day, whatever your calling is, whether it's to write a book, whether it's to heal history, there is always one aspect that God wants from us. And that's to be closer to him, to commit ourselves to him in a marriage relationship. And as part of that, to heal the history not just of our own lives, not just of our generational stream, but of our nation and ultimately of the world. And he wants us to work together to do it. Because without my friends who gave me the clues, red hair and atonement, as well as agreed that the spirit of rejection constantly says to your soul, I am your only friend. I would have missed entirely what God wanted me to know. So this is what I want to say to you. Don't be persistent. Sure, yeah. Scripture tells us to be persistent, but that's not really what it's all about. And certainly not don't take it personally or just shrug it off. 
but actually go and heal history. Do what it takes. Sit with Jesus for six days, and if it takes you more than six days, then you go back to him and you say, so what's taking me so long? What am I doing? That is actually me trying to accomplish what's necessary. One of the things that you will find when you start to do that is that your heart is not in agreement with the atonement of Jesus. Mm. Parts of your heart will just go, yeah, I believe. But there are parts that are so deep in unbelief, they go, the atonement actually is not enough for me to overcome this problem. I've been rejected so many times, the atonement is not enough to overcome this rejection. And that's what you have to deal with. You have to deal with the parts of your heart that say, rejection's my only friend and I'm sorry, Jesus. What you did on the cross is not enough. That unbelief of the heart that says, I can't get past this. And that is what we found, me and my friends, that there are parts of our hearts that just say, I cannot do this. I can't believe this. We are like the centurion who said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And God is constantly with us, exposing more and more parts of our heart that simply say, yeah, I can believe you for this, Jesus, but I can't believe you for that. And as you see stories throughout Scripture, you see how we're part of the human story. You can see Abraham, for example. He could believe that God would be with him to rescue his nephew against five armies. But he could not believe that God would be with him when he went to a foreign country with his wife and be able to say, this is my wife. You can see Peter saying, yes, sure. I'm going to do this for you, Lord. I'm going to stick by you to the end and then three times denying Jesus. At a threshold moment, there he is at that threshold and it's really clear in John chapter 18 that it is a threshold moment because there are so many references to doorways all the way through that chapter. So what God is asking us to do is quite simply this. Be his partner, marriage partner, go and heal history, do what it takes. Sit with Jesus as if in Gethsemane and ask him to fix the situation because that's what he does best.